In the fall of my freshman year of college, the trip hop producer DJ Shadow released his debut album, Introducing. And on that album is a track. It's a little vignette, maybe 45 seconds long. And the title is Why Hip Hop Sucks in 96. And as the track goes on, about halfway through, a voice says, it's the money. It's the money. And I wanted to do this video, Why Crypto Sucks in 22, because it's the money transmission laws. This is something that very few people in the space know anything about, very few people talk about, but if you want to understand every single thing about the cryptocurrency and Bitcoin space as it exists today, down to the power players involved, the names that you know, it's all about this concept. So this is some, it's not secret knowledge, maybe it's an open secret, but knowing this will very much help you to navigate this technology as we move forward, as we're seeing the banks, the financial institutions are becoming much less reliable. And people are talking about now with many things going on, they're talking about wanting to make a move, actively wanting to make a move toward Bitcoin and cryptocurrency to get more financial sovereignty, to have more control over their financial future. And I totally support that. Bitcoin Mystery School, I teach it every month, bitcoinmysteryschool.com. You can go and register. It's available right now. I'd love to have you on board. We don't talk about this topic, but I surely will be sharing this, and we do talk about it in our uh, private groups that we have. So everybody who registers and is a student can participate in that. All right, enough shilling. I didn't do this video to do that. What, what do I want to talk to you about? I want to talk to you about money transmission laws or money service business laws and specifically i want to talk to you about them as it relates to the united states you might be saying here but i'm not in the u.s so this video is not for me not true the crazy thing about these particular laws is that already people who have no association with the u.s are not u.s citizens have never stepped foot on U.S. soil and are not on U.S. soil will be arrested by authorities and extradited to the United States if they interact with any American citizens. That's how broad this is and how vast the powers of the powers that be who are involved in the financial institution web globally are. A very different web. This is something that I hope to talk about more in the future because a lot of people think that we're still in the phase of governments. But with some of the recent actions, especially Canada saying that they can freeze bank accounts of basically whoever they choose as of today, as I'm recording this, I think a lot of people are going to have a rude awakening to understand who's really in control of things. So what I first want to talk about is why I say that the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space is completely related to these laws. The first thing. What is Bitcoin? The first thing that I tell all of my students, the very first thing that we do, we read the first sentence of the Bitcoin white paper to see what is Bitcoin. And then you'll start to understand how there's been a vast amount of corruption. And probably what you think Bitcoin is, it's not actually what it is. And it's the thing that was born out of what makes crypto suck in 22. So the first sentence of the Bitcoin white paper is, a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. What Bitcoin is all about, the entire purpose, its entire reason for existing, is the elimination of financial institutions. Banks, basically. Now, if you're dealing with companies that are exchanges, for instance, if you're dealing with Coinbase, it's a financial institution, not even just in name, but in law. And the reason why it has to be a financial institution in law is because of the U.S.'s very draconian and very broad money transmitter laws. Maybe the first thing, and this is shocking to people, is what happens to you if you 
try to behave like a Coinbase, for instance, if you were to try to start up Coinbase, which actually, for any competent developer, it's not a very difficult business. It's not a difficult system, which is part of the key of this entire concept. If we go to Title 18 of the U.S. Code, uh, Section 1960, it's called the Prohibition of Unlicensed Money Transmitting Business. And it says, whoever knowingly conducts, controls, manages, supervises, directs, or owns all or part of an unlicensed money transmitting business shall be fined in accordance with this title or imprisoned not more than five years or both. So if you were to just begin and you're going to operate Coinbase because you can, because it's open, or you just even want to, and this has been happening, it's happened for many years, go on to local Bitcoins and go ahead and uh, try to set up a trade with somebody and you set up a trade and that person happens to be a law enforcement agent, you can be an unlicensed money transmitter because you were going to buy cryptocurrency from them or you were going to sell them cryptocurrency just in person up to five years in federal prison. It's a felony. It's a felony. Buried away, right? You wouldn't think five years, completely nonviolent crime between two parties. Not only that, it gets worse. So not only, this is one of these weird laws where you could tell that the people who were involved with it are truly powerful to be able to get something like this passed. Not only... And I, I don't know where I've seen a law like this before. Not only is it illegal uh, if you violate the federal laws, but it says, as used in this section, the term unlicensed money transmitting business means a money transmitting business which affects interstate or foreign commerce in any manner and is operated without an appropriate money transmitting license in a state where such operation is punishable as a misdemeanor or a felony under state law, whether or not the defendant knew that the operation was required to be licensed or that the operation was so punishable. So that means that if you are in violation of any state regulation about money transmitting, even if you didn't know that there was a state regulation, even if it's an obscure state regulation, you automatically become in violation of the federal statute, which carries five years in prison. So even if the punishment for the state thing was like a $100 fine, because it's a, just a, some little state law, and you violate it, now you're guilty of the federal, even if you hadn't violated the federal side. So that's pretty crazy. And what does this do? Like, what has it done? This has basically been around and enforced. It's enforced by the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which is called FinCEN. It's a, a de department or section of the Treasury Department, the U.S. Treasury Department. Basically, what it's, it's done is it's put really a great fear into people, especially investors. And it's meant that although there are ways, and I'm going to talk about these right here, Although there are ways to build these businesses that they don't fall under these licensing requirements, a company like Coinbase, when it wants to start up, it just says, well, this is just a capital expense. This is just some amount of money that needs to be spent in order for us to be legal. And at the time they do that, they're a financial institution. And at the time they do that, they're basically within the banking cartel, within the banking system. And now... Remember, the point of Bitcoin is to not have to go through a financial institution. So now that's done with. And now you can start to see how what we have is a cryptocurrency space chock full of and basically run by the power brokers are licensed financial institutions with a technology that was built to remove financial institutions you can start to see how this is not going to work. You can start to see how there's a problem with participating in this activity. So one of the things that 
I have found important and that I've been working on for the last four years with my businesses. And, uh, you know, quick shout out and thanks to Dave Burson, the attorney who was our legal counsel for my company, Cointext, who was really very much my mentor on this. I'm going to tell you a, a little bit of the things that I learned, pass those on to you, because this has been coming up with other entrepreneurs who have wanted to talk with me about businesses as of late. So hopefully this is just something that the next time it comes up, I can hand over to them. But I'm just going to give you the information as it's been explained to me, as I've been able to use it moving forward, and as I understand it to exist, I'll talk about the sorts of solutions and things that I have seen related to Bitcoin. This is not financial advice. I am not a lawyer, although I have spent umpteen hours with lawyers discussing these concepts as I built my own businesses. So I'm going to be discussing this as a layman, not a lawyer. This is not financial advice. I advise you to read the things that I am going to discuss. And I also advise you to, if, you're going, if you think about going and pursuing any of these business activities, please engage the counsel of an attorney who is a subject matter expert. That's also very important. Attorney who knows something about this space. It would be very, very helpful, very worth it. If you are going to pursue this, I have personal friends who decided not to do that at various times and it really did not turn out well for them, okay? These are laws that are enforced. They are absolutely enforced heavily. What I'm going to read from is a document that is called the Application of FinCEN's, that's the Financial Crime Enforcement Network, Regulations to Certain Business Models Involving Convertible Virtual Currencies, or CVCs. Convertible Virtual Currencies is what the U.S. government calls cryptocurrency. So this includes all Bitcoin, everything, Ethereum, you know, whatever. Convertible Virtual Currencies. And the laws have not been changed regarding cryptocurrency, so we're actually operating on old money transmitter laws. But what they have done is that they have put in place um, these laws and they have given guidance over the years. So beginning in 2011, they started giving this guidance. And the most recent that we have is from 2019. And so I'm going to be reading from and talking about briefly what and how these laws are enforced because they're basically saying how do they enforce these laws when it comes to cryptocurrency so it begins and it says in in 2011 fincen issued a final rule defining a money service business as so these are the money transmitters here a person wherever located doing business whether or not on a regular basis or as an organized or licensed business concern wholly or in substantial part within the united states operating directly or through an agent, agency, branch, or office who functions as, among other things, a money transmitter. FinCEN's regulations describe or define the term money transmitter to include, quote, a person that provides money transmission services or any other person engaged in the transfer of funds. Pretty straightforward. Now, the term money transmission services is defined to mean the acceptance of currency, funds, or other value that substitutes for currency from one person and the transmission of currency, funds, or other value that substitutes for currency to another location or person by any means. The term other value that substitutes for currency encompasses situations in which the transmission does not involve currency or funds, but instead involves something that the parties to a transaction recognize has value that is equivalent to or can substitute for currency. So what's interesting here is that really what it's talking about is three parties in order for it's not peer to peer. Three parties. The person, so I'm a money transmitter if I accept currency from one person or something that substitutes for currency and I transmit anything that is currency or substitutes for currency to another person or location. So something that you will learn in Bitcoin Mystery School, something that most people, even thought leaders, really get wrong conceptually, but the U.S. government is very well aware of it. 
when you send me bitcoins or you send me ethereum you're not actually sending it to me now i see it coming up in my wallet but in 99.99 percent of the cases what you do is you construct a transaction and you send that transaction up to a node bitcoin node let's say where it is processed and then when it's traveled out to the network i can see that it exists in my wallet like a browser so what they are essentially saying is that when i go to you and i say hey can i buy twenty dollars worth of bitcoin from you and i hand you a twenty dollar bill you have now accepted currency from me and then you transmit a transaction to another location or person the node you don't send anything to me and they say that's the third person and I become a money transmitter it's a really slick way of doing it but you can see that basically shuts off how much of crypto innovation of the possible businesses that could use Bitcoin and it's the reason why we are where we are this is so important they also say uh, their regulations does not limit or qualify the scope of the term value that substitutes for currency. So basically anything that they say can substitute for currency uh, can be a currency. And they see the term virtual currency, so this is convertible virtual currency, refers to a medium of exchange that can operate like a currency, but does not have all the attributes of quote, real currency including legal tender status. CVC is a type of virtual currency that either has an equivalent value as currency or acts as a substitute for currency and therefore and is therefore a type of value that substitutes for currency. So they say it's not currency. It's not currency. Just like I say Bitcoin is not money. Even the federal government says Bitcoin is not money. They say it in the IRS. They say it's property. Right? They say it in the, the IRS regulations, and the Treasury Department says it right here that it's value that substitutes for currency. Okay, So they say it's not currency as well. So they have some interesting sections where they discuss the various things that you can and cannot do as, either a, as a pleb, as a non-money transmitter. So things like mining, they say that's okay, and mining pools are okay. Um, they talk about hosted and unhosted wallets. So a hosted wallet would be like Coinbase, not your keys, not your coins. Somebody else has the, the keys and they say hosted wallets for sure. Those are money transmitters. No question. They talk about unhosted wallets. So these are like, you know, your average, like Badger wallet that I maintain. These are your average wallets that someone could go and download from the app store. They give you your private keys or your backup phrase, your mnemonic phrase, as the case may be. And you can use them. They say unhosted wallets are not money transmitters if A, the value by definition is the property of the owner and is stored in a wallet. So they first off, they've gotten this wrong. You can't own Bitcoins. We got to get this ownership meme out of here. You can see how big of a problem is. While B, the owner interacts with the payment system directly and has total independent control over the value insofar as the person conducting a transaction through the unhosted wallet is doing so to purchase goods or services on the user's own behalf. They are not a money transmitter. So they have basically opened it up and said, look, if you control the keys, if your wallet interacts with a node and the payment system and you're using this to buy goods or services, you're good. Unregulated activity perfectly fine but as people say to me all the time well what can i actually buy with bitcoin and isn't that the big problem also they talk about unhosted multi-signature wallets so if there's multiple signatures involved and they say uh it's not a money transmitter if a the value belongs to the owner and is stored in the wallet just it's unhosted it's got to be unhosted uh, B, the owner interacts with the wallet software and pay or payment system to initiate a transaction, supplying part of the credential, so one signature. Uh, C, the person participating in the transaction, the other person, uh, participates to provide additional validation at the request of the owner, and they don't have total independent control over the value. So that is to say, there's some other person that needs to make an additional signature. Maybe we've gotten into some agreement. They give me the signature. I make the transaction. I broadcast it. Totally fine. 
ATM machines. This was something very early on that I thought was, was really wonderful and was one of the biggest and most important things. They're like, nope. They call them CVC kiosks, convertible virtual currency kiosks. They say, if they accept and transmit value, they're money transmitters. Importantly, dApps and DAOs. So your Ethereum smart contracts, all your DeFi stuff, those are dApps. They say decentralized or distributed application is a term that refers to software programs that operate on a P2P network of computers running a blockchain platform designed such that they are not controlled by a single person or group of persons. An owner operator of a dApp may deploy it to perform a wide variety of functions, including acting as an unincorporated organization, a DAO, such as a software agency to provide financial services. Generally, a DAP user must pay a fee to the DAP for the ultimate benefit of the owner operator in order to run the software. So DeFi. The fee is commonly paid in crypto. The same regulatory interpretation that applies to mechanical agencies such as uh, CVC kiosks, so ATM machines, applies to dApps that accept and transmit value. So they say, well, just because it's a smart contract running on the blockchain, still, still a money transmitter regardless of whether they operate for profit, even if it doesn't operate for profit, even if it doesn't make a profit. Accordingly, when dApps perform money transmission, the definition of money transmitter will apply to the dApp, the owner operators of the dApp, or both. So that is to say all of these DeFi contracts, basically all of the people who have created them, and certainly anybody who is... Uh, is profiting from them in any way, and even if they're not, can all be arrested today. Today. Not to say that they will, but the federal government definitely could arrest them today and put them in federal prison for five years. This is something that most people don't know. Something that most people don't know. Also, there are some things about users themselves, potentially, could be considered money transmitters. Uh, if they are using it to do uh, money transfer. And how would you know? How would you know? So this is something that really applies to Ethereum. It doesn't apply to Bitcoin. It applies to other smart contract chains. Nobody's talking about this. Okay? That hammer could drop at any time. Anytime the feds decide they're going to spend the effort on it, anytime they decide somebody has gotten out of hand, this has been sitting there since 2019, ready to go for them. Uh, decentralized exchanges. They actually say that if uh, an exchange, a plat CVC trading platform only provides a forum where buyers and sellers post their bids and offers and the parties themselves settle them through an outside venue, then the trading platform doesn't qualify as a money transmitter. Now, the people settling it might still qualify as money transmitters, but the trading platform doesn't. That's the only thing for decentralized exchanges. Not a decentralized exchange that is working through a smart contract. So not your favorite NFT trading platform, for instance. All of those are money transmitters. Now, eventually, somebody gets big enough, one of these companies get big enough, and they just go ahead and get the licenses. And this becomes the problem. Because the whole entire purpose of Bitcoin and its use as a tool, its way that it's a, an, an arc and an escape hatch, is that people can actually use it even under the draconian laws, to buy and sell goods and services, it's totally fine. Totally fine. And my guess is they will leave it just like it is. Because when they say financial institutions are now going to uh, confiscate, seize, close accounts of people who have ran afoul politically of the government, as they're doing right now, in Canada, where they're saying people who have supported peaceful protests, if you've just supported it financially, you can have your account frozen by your financial institution. That's going to include exchanges, things like Coinbase. This is coming. So any of these institutions, when they get big enough, any of these companies, when they get big enough and then they go and they get their licensing, we're right back to where we started. So I think this is a very important thing to think about. There actually are, and I would advise people who want to do business, to go and read where the exemptions are. You know, I've said quite a few times now that laws are reactionary. 
If you're truly, truly innovating, there's probably not a law talking about what it is that you're doing. Laws are always made in reaction to somebody having done something. Now, I'm not one to say that the correct action is to kowtow to governments that are being tyrannical. But at the same time, you don't kick the gorilla in the nuts. We can do a lot of good and operate well if we're truly innovating. If we look at the box that they've given us and we're creative and entrepreneurial and innovative and we build the things that can fit inside of those boxes. Make them catch up. Businesses like Uber have been fantastic at this in the last couple of decades. That's what we need. We need that kind of thinking. We need that kind of innovation. It's not going to serve anybody for you to, you know, spend a little bit of time going, trying to kick the gorilla in the nuts and you find yourself five years in federal prison, you know, and ruined from the legal fight that you had to, to undergo. So I hope this was helpful. I'm definitely going to be passing this on because I've had this conversation so many times now. I thought that I would share it with, with you. I hope that you will want to build more. I hope that this is not something that just goes over your head or something that seemed like, ah, it has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with you right now. Don't wait. <laughs> Don't wait until you have no other choice but to start looking around for, oh, well, how can I get by with these alternative currencies? Be a part of helping to build it while we still have a little bit of runway. It's not much. But we got to take advantage of what we have. We got to take advantage of the time and the space that we have and be ambitious, be innovative. Thank you for your time on this. I hope to see you building right alongside with me.